For nearly a century, Hollywood has thrilled us with its glamour, beauty, power, and illusion, both on screen and off. But today, a new Hollywood is emerging in surprising places and with new players. How often do you get to say that you've been to India? We'll travel the world to unlock the secrets of both the old and the new as we go Backstage Hollywood. This strip mall was once the hidden world where Charlie Chaplin created his movie magic. And on this corner, now called Century City, Daryl Zanuck started the 20th Century Fox Empire nearly 70 years ago. These were the kingmakers of old Hollywood, and they ran their studios like private empires. They created stars and took care of their every need. Today, many backlots have been bulldozed. The film factories of yesteryear have given way to location shooting, and stars compete for the best trailer rather than the biggest dressing room. But there's one place where the studio system lives on, though it's not exactly in the heart of Hollywood. Welcome to Film City, India the largest studio on earth. Its founder, Ramaji Rao, is a modern-day Louis B. Mayer, who has drawn filmmakers from around the globe. I would like them to come, understand, appreciate, experience, and then uh, accept the fact that this is the best facility anywhere in the world. The new Hollywood is located halfway around the world. And the nearby city of Hyderabad, with a population of over 5 million, has been turned into a factory town. Many locals work at the studio, just like in Hollywood of old. Film City combines state-of-the-art technology with simple, old-fashioned muscle. Running the high-tech end is Raghu Sadambi, head of the Digital Editing and Visual Effects Division. We have a film processing laboratory, we have an editing facility, we have a digital film facility, and we have an audio post-production facility. Anybody who comes in from LA would not expect the sort of a facility to exist in India, much less in a village in India. Rao employs over 7,000 local workers, most of whom are brought in by bus each morning. Behind the city's iron gates lies a modern-day Oz dedicated to the magic of movie making. Let's pull a little swamp grass around. An American company is shooting the thriller Death Roll about a killer crocodile. Now going halfway across the world to film may seem far, especially when this story takes place in Mexico. The film itself is benefiting because based upon the budget that we do have for this movie, we're getting a lot more bang for the buck. But shooting here isn't without problems. Jungle insects aren't something they prepare you for in acting school. When you see these terrified faces of all of us actors, we are really terrified it's from the bugs, not necessarily the crocodiles. But those are the only bugs you'll find in this system. Everything else is under the strict control of Ramaji Rao. Just like in the studio days of Hollywood, everything from editors to extras is under one roof. Seven years we have taken for building up the film city. This is in operation more or less for the last two years. It's really a, a filmmaker's dream in many ways because he can come into one location, 
It's absolutely comprehensive. A movie maker himself, Rao found it difficult to fly from location to location, struggling to find craftsmen, scrounging to get equipment. So he decided to create a one-stop shop for filmmakers. The studio was a godsend to India's own film industry. While they may not have the budget of Hollywood, more films are made here than anywhere in the world. Native directors like Rajesh Bhatia fell in love with the place. Oh, I'm enjoying it very much because um, everything is just available here. I mean, you just call up and you get things. You need a scale model of a 4,000-year-old boat or a miniature of a passenger jet? So, this airplane, what you see, this is made out of fiberglass. Or maybe you want a Martian city. Just ring up the art department and an army of 1,200 craftsmen will build one that's out of this world. The six-story prop department puts most Hollywood shops to shame. If they don't have what you want, you guessed it, it's made to order. Custom creations are all in a day's work for the studio's 150 tailors, but they'll stitch around the clock to get a wardrobe ready in time. Their biggest demand is costumes for the dancing girls, a fixture of Indian movies. But an even bigger fixture are the gardens. Here in Film City, there are over 150 genuine live gardens for crews to shoot in. English gardens, Japanese, Swiss, Egyptian. To ensure authenticity, they import the flora from its native habitat. Of course, not every movie takes place in the Garden of Eden. How about a fake train station, a pretend pagoda, or a big city hospital facade? We have a uh, uh, vast number of locations. We have over 500 locations uh, in the film city. And when they build a set, they don't scrimp. Unlike the usual flimsy wooden facades used in most films, here they use real cement and mortar. Film city is designed like, well, a city. So filmmakers never have to leave for anything. There's a real commissary, a working post office, travel agency, laundry, fully staffed hospital, and for producers who can't stay on budget, an active financing service which gives instant loans. At day's end, cast and crew can wallow in luxury at one of two top-of-the-line hotels. And the food here is a lot better than you'd find on most movie sets. It's very delicious. It's, it's Indian food. Everybody loves Indian food. But you have to get used to having that every day. You're still in a different country. It's a different culture, different language. Everyone admits the language barrier can cause an occasional bump in the road. But if money talks, then Ramaji Film City speaks a language that all producers love. The price of building this set was probably 800,000 rupees, which translates to maybe $20,000, $15,000, This set might have cost $800,000 in the United States. Super savings combined with ultra extravagance will always be a hit with movie companies. In a business where making fantasies is all in a day's work, Ramaji Film City is a filmmaker's dream. Coming up, they fight for the best dress, and they fight for the best stars. And later, why is this doctor the latest weapon in the Oscar Wars?
It's been a Hollywood tradition since 1929 and a favorite event of movie fans for just as long. It's the Academy Awards, and today it draws an audience of nearly one billion TV viewers. But go behind the scenes, and you'll find there's more being judged here than the movies. Oscar night rates as the ultimate fashion show. How a star looks on that red carpet runway can affect how the rest of us will dress for the next year. So the rivalry between designers is fierce. Congratulations. <laughs> if you're a nominee and they think you're going to win, everybody's courting you and you have a lot of choices. In the last minute, a lot of people change their mind. This is one of the rarely seen backstage battlegrounds, and these are the trenches, the guest rooms of L'Hermitage Hotel in Beverly Hills. One week before the Oscars, the top fashion houses set up shop, turning deluxe suites into makeshift showrooms. At L'Hermitage, the event is coordinated by general manager Jack Nadarkani. During the Oscar time, this is one stop shopping for all the entertainment people. We have a full staff of 240 people standing by for last minute changes and needs as these people are coming in. With rooms costing as much as $3,800 a night, L'Hermitage is the perfect private location for celebrity shopping. Here, designers like Craig Nattiello of Halston try to sew up Hollywood's elite by matching the actress to the attire. I love the idea of a beautiful color like this on the red carpet. How marvelous that would be on Ned Benning. Having an Oscar nominee seen in one of his dresses is the equivalent of a free ad on the Super Bowl. I would love this on Sharon Stone. How beautiful would she look in that? I mean, she just totally takes my breath away. Equally breathtaking is the price tag on these creations, about three to $5,000 a piece. But Hollywood's leading ladies don't have to pay a thing. The designers often give the gowns away to gain worldwide exposure. Of course, they don't want their originals going to just anyone. The designers can be as choosy about their stars as the stars are about designers. We're thinking of maybe three people who we're targeting. And that's why they're special. That's why there's only three racks here. That's why there's not 20 racks. If all goes well, the right star finds the right gown, eventually. But it wouldn't be fitting to stop there. Accessories are next. In Hollywood, diamonds really are a girl's best friend. Diamonds, diamonds in the sky. Girls love diamonds, my oh my. Diamonds, diamonds in the sky. Diamonds, diamonds, my oh my. Diamonds have really become a, a staple at the Academy Awards. People talk about the diamonds as much as they talk about the dresses today. And with creations like these, talk definitely isn't cheap. Gem specialist Joan Parker has been through every facet of the annual fashion showdown. And if you think these jewels are precious, just imagine the value of an Oscar shoe in. Every year there is always one dream person everybody wants, and it depends upon who everybody thinks is going to be the person who's going to win. And everybody goes after that person. One year for Shakespeare in Love, it was Gwyneth Paltrow. To buy or not to buy, that is the question. With some trinkets worth as much as $3 million, jewelry designers are hoping that one person out there will go ahead and make their day. We all know that Gwyneth Paltrow wore Harry Winston necklace, which later her father bought and gave to her as a present for winning. Jewelers lend out their creations because when actors win an Oscar, it puts them in the mood to buy. Nicholas Cage, the year that he won, he had his wife with him and she was bedecked in jewels and diamonds and he said, if I win tonight, you're gonna, I'm buying those for you. And he won and he bought them for her. So that's what every um, jeweler wants to see at the end of the day. Of course, most of the time, the rocks are returned, like this half million dollar 11 carat ring worn by Sophia Loren. The younger stars, often the British stars, don't want to wear something that is too over the top this particular Fred Layton piece was worn last year by Liv Tyler. When stars wear jewelry this pricey to the Oscars, the designers hire armed guards to collect it after the celebrations. They're given dresses and they're given a lot of things. When it comes to diamond jewelry, they're not. It's just, you know, too valuable and expensive to be giving it away. 
The other thing they're not giving away are the adornments of choice for male movie stars. Jewel encrusted watches. Michelle Newman and Scott Woodward are showing watches that cost as much as a house in the suburbs. This is our most expensive piece here right now. It's $350,000 and it's a Concorde Saratoga encrusted in diamonds and sapphires.